Yes. Oh, did you uh, hear me? I mean, are you there, Asha? Otherwise, someone else can do it. I think she's probably not at her desk at the moment. Uh, could we have Avni pray? Could you please pray? Sure, ma'am. Good morning. Good morning. Father God, we are so very thankful to you for this beautiful day that has come into our life. We will rejoice and be glad in it, Abba Father. And thank you for this platform. Thank you for this time of learning, Abba Father, enriching us. Lord Father, as we are being taught, Father, we ask you to bless our pastor. We ask you to bless all the, all the students who are joining in who would be hearing this later also, Abba Father. We pray for your anointing to flow, your presence to be with us, Father, your wisdom to be our portion today, Abba Father. So whatever we learn, may we be able to live by it, apply it, and bless others through it, Abba Father. Let it grow in us like a seed. We give you glory, honor, and praise for everything that you're doing in and through our lives. And th thank you once again, Father, for this time of learning. We give you glory, honor, and praise, and ask this prayer in the precious and matchless name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. OK, uh, we have um, finished 15 chapters. Uh, so today we, are, we will hopefully cover chapters 16 and 17. Um, we have now come into the final section where Jesus has now started giving a final set of teachings to his disciples uh, because he knows that the hour has come. The hour which has he has been anticipating right from the beginning, uh, you know, the hour of the crucifixion, uh, when he will finally accomplish the work for which he has come into this uh, world. So um, now we are into John 16. In the previous chapter, he talked about how he is the wine. And uh, if we abide in him, we will be like branches that are attached to him. So uh, uh, his life will flow into us and uh, we will be able to bear fruit. And then he warns that there would be a lot of opposition um, because the world will hate uh, uh, them. He wants his disciples in the same way they have hated me. They will hate you as well. And then he says, I know um, the, uh, I will send a helper, a paracletos, and uh, he will be there for you. Uh, so in John chapter 16, uh, it begins with these words. Uh, if we could have someone read out the first three verses, please. I have said all these things to you to keep you from falling away. They will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming and whoever kills you will think he's offering sacrifice services to God. And they will do these things because they have not known the Father nor me. So Jesus, uh, I mean, in this chapter, I mean, of course, you know, it's like a um, division of chapters that was done later because in the original, it would have been just one continual narrative. Uh, so. Um, in verse 1, it says, all this I have told you so that you will not fall away. So all all what? You know, whatever was mentioned in the earlier chapter, how they are part of him. Uh, as long as they are in him, they will be able to bear fruit. Uh, but this doesn't mean that everything will go well for them. The world will hate them uh, because they do not belong to the world. They belong to the father and the world hates the father. So they will obviously hate the disciples. But Jesus assures them that there will be an advocate that he would be sending. He will testify about Jesus and uh, lead them into all truth. Uh, so these are all the things which Jesus shares. And he says, all this I have told you so that you will not fall away. Uh, and he warns and says, they will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, the time is coming when anyone who kills you will think they are offering a service to God. Uh, and uh, this is what we actually see happening in the lives of the uh, disciples later, uh, because the uh, Jewish leaders uh, they you know um, take steps against them to uh, to beat them, whip them, uh, to excommunicate some of them, uh, to even um, you know kill many of the followers. So we see all of this happening. So these things are all writ written down, recorded by John. Uh, because his audience is undergoing that kind of a persecution. They are facing a lot of opposition from the leaders, the leaders who are considered as custodians of the word of God, 
the leaders who are supposed to be um, knowledgeable about all spiritual matters, they are the very people who are pointing fingers at the small group and saying, you are uh, you know, traitors to the faith. You are following something which is wrong. And so a chance is there that uh, these poor um, you know, believers may start wondering, you know, have we made a mistake? After all, what do we know? It's these uh, religious leaders who have all the information in their hands. They are the ones who have studied the scrolls. Uh, they are the ones who know what is there in the Old Testament. Uh, so maybe we are mistaken. Maybe we are holding on to a faith and getting persecuted uh, you know, for something which is not really correct. And so all our effort is in vain. So they would have probably get these doubts. And so Jesus says, I'm telling you about this now itself because, um, you know, uh, so that you will not fall away. And he says, this advocate, this paracletos, the one who is who is going to be by your side, he will testify about me. He will remind you of the things which I have taught. So do not think that you are in the wrong. What you are believing is correct. So hold on to the truth because this is the truth which I have revealed to you. So, you know, um, never doubt never think that even when these powerful leaders are saying that you're wrong do not doubt it they are going to be so confident in their blindness that they that when they kill you they will think that they are doing something good because they have chosen to be blinded they did not want to see the truth the truth was too uncomfortable for them uh, the truth would cost them their positions of power and influence so because of that they chose to be blind it, it, it was easier for them to just blind themselves to the truth so now they have hardened their hearts and blinded themselves to such an extent that they in fact feel good when they persecute people who are speaking the truth. So the Lord says a day will come when they will, when they will actually think that they are doing God a service when they kill you. But do not um, be swayed by all of that because the Holy Spirit who is in you will remind you of the truth and he will assure you that what you believe is the truth and that uh, what the leaders are saying, in fact, is wrong. So he will guide you. He will be there to back up what you believe in. So do not be swayed. Do not fall away, is what Jesus is trying to convey in these uh, verses. Um, why do the people hate the Father? Uh, mainly because uh, you know Jesus comes to them and he says, I am from the Father. And he begins, begins to teach things uh, which are uh, very painful to their flesh. Um, for the leaders, uh, he is telling them, uh, you know, you need to uh, believe in me. Uh, and in their eyes, they see him as a carpenter's son, someone who doesn't have any uh, social status. And uh, so uh, they believe that this version of the father that Jesus is preaching is all wrong. They They hate what Jesus is telling them about the father. Also, Jesus is not just very gentle and quiet about their uh, you know, faults. Very openly, he says, you are hypocrites. Very openly, he says, ah, I know you're very, very faithful in your tithing. But look at the way you treat your family. Look at the way you're treating your elderly parents. You know, he's very open, very blunt, exposing all their um, uh, wrong. And also, there are Old Testament practices to which he's now adding new meaning. And uh, they had always practiced fasting. And now Jesus is saying, you know, fasting has to be done in a particular context uh, because otherwise it's just an empty ritual. And uh, they don't like it. They've always liked the status quo because, you know, they are the ones who have um, established that set of uh, rules and uh, uh, running uh, the synagogue and running the temple in a certain way. And all of this by, by holding on to the status quo and by running things in a certain way, they are able to hold on to their power. So. They do not like it that Jesus is saying that this is what the father is saying, that you are wrong, uh, that uh, this is another way to do uh, things. And I have come uh, in accordance with what the prophets prophesied. So the father had, has already sent prophets who are pointing towards me. So I am the way. I am the truth. What I'm saying is true. And uh, they don't like this version of the father at all. Uh, in their minds, they have this other idea of what Yahweh is like, and they would they would rather hold on to that. They do not like the picture that Jesus is presenting of the Father, a very different Father from the kind that they had in mind. Uh, so they do not like their position uh, shaken, and uh, so they dislike the Father uh, 
uh, due to their own selfish ambitions and desires. And also, they do not like him pointing out their mistakes and their defects so openly. Uh, so um, that's probably why they hate him so much. Yeah. Um, we were looking at, yes, how, how these people would, uh, the leaders would rise up against the true believers. Um, so uh, the audience would have uh, felt uh, encouraged after reading this uh, because, you know, um, they would be probably be in small groups here and there, and they would be uh, probably even be excommunicated. And so they are probably feeling very lonely and alone. And they are wondering whether they're making all of these sacrifices for nothing. What if the leaders are correct? And so here, these verses are assuring them, no, listen to the voice of the Parakletos inside you, the one who has come to stand next to you. He is reminding you of things that I taught. He is testifying about what I have said. So hold on to that truth and do not be swayed. So these words would have encouraged them. And we see this even later, uh, you know, much later through the centuries, um, when, when you know, people of God were persecuted, uh, during different eras. Uh, I mean, I was looking at one one uh, commentary where it was talking about uh, an archbishop named Cranmer. And um, uh, Cranmer, uh, you know, once the Bible got uh, translated into English and then it was printed. Um, so this, uh, this person being the archbishop, being in a very powerful position where he can do something for the people, he began to distribute the English Bible everywhere because he wanted everyone to start reading it and uh, discover the truths in it and you know become strong in God. So with that noble um, you know uh, intent, he begins to distribute the English Bible to all the churches which are there, you know, in all the parishes, um, and uh, even as he is doing that. Uh, the queen who is uh, who is on the throne at that time is a Catholic, uh, Mary the First, and uh, she is against the distribution of Bibles because she doesn't want uh, you know um, Protestantism, you know the people who are believing in the Bible and following the Bible. She is against that, and uh, so she decides to uh, begin to persecute him. Uh, so it's rather interesting. Um, she is one very powerful representative of the Catholic Church at that time. And it's very, very clear that she does not want the Bible distributed openly to everyone. She does not want people to start opening their Bibles and discovering what it says over there, because then they will know what is true and what is false. Because at that time, the Catholic Church was using its position and power you know, to uh, exploit the people and keep them under control and take get money from them. Because you can purchase your way to heaven by giving money. So the church was getting rich. Everything was going well for them. So we see a lot of parallels between the Pharisees of Jesus' time and these people who are, uh, you know, sometime in the Middle Ages. Uh, so there is, um, uh, we see the same trend, you know, always the opposition to the Father, the hatred towards the things of uh, the Father. It is always to cushion their own positions to make sure that the status quo stays and uh, people do not do not get to know the truth. So there's always a desire to hide the truth, uh, to kind of you know dismiss it as, as something false so that people will not discover that it is indeed correct. So uh, in this particular case, uh, uh, Mary the First, she decides to have this Archbishop uh, Cranmer. Uh, she has him burnt. So he's literally tied over there to a pole and they set fire to the person when he's still very much alive. And he begins to burn. And while he's being burnt, they, um, you know, they have a passionate sermon being preached. I mean, it's such a horrible thing. A person is literally dying over there, probably screaming in pain. And they have a sermon being preached because they believe that what they are doing is such a good and noble thing. So you see, you can allow yourself to be blinded to such an extent where you are tormenting a person and putting to, uh, them to death in such a terrible manner and you think that you're doing so uh, something so noble that you actually stand over there and proudly preach while that you know while that torture is being done uh, so um, it, this is just one shocking instance of how um, wrong can be promoted by leaders in power because now they have become that blind to the truth 
And yes, we had a person raising their hand. Yes, please go ahead. Yes, Pastor. Thank you, Pastor. Sorry to interrupt you. I, I just want to take you back to uh, when you mentioned we we're talking about the viewpoint of how the um, spiritual leaders, or would I say the Pharisees, um, the idea of um, you said Father, uh, but I, I was going to ask that: Did they even see God as Father? That, that's another question at that time. I. To me, when I see read through scripture, it's like they just dealt with God as someone who could not relate. I don't know. And so Jesus now bringing a perception of relationship was just way beyond their thinking. And they didn't want to have um, such perception, again, like you mentioned, in order for them to keep their influence. So I just got, I just wanted to confirm that in your own view of scriptures, um did they really view god as father I, I think it was only jesus that could actually reveal that and that was what they stood against uh, when jesus christ um, brought such percep perception thank you pastor yeah i uh, yes it is true that um uh, they didn't really have a very personal um concept of god as a very personal father um but you know, it, to an extent, they did see themselves as the um, uh, children of Yahweh. Um, you know, so uh, if we were to look at, yeah, you know, I mean, I was just, just, I was just kind of thinking of, um, uh, you know, Solomon when he dedicates the temple and uh, how he addresses uh, God. Um, So uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm just trying to look for the verse because I had not really thought about this earlier. Uh, you know, uh, okay, just let's just take one random verse from the dedication passage. Uh, you know, Second Chronicles chapter six, um, verse twenty-four, because my eyes just fell on that. Second <laughs> uh, Chronicles chapter six, verse twenty-four, where uh, you know Solomon is making his prayer of dedication and he says when your people israel having sinned against you are defeated by an enemy and then uh, in verse 25 he goes on to say may you hear from heaven and forgive the sin of your people israel so uh, in a sense they considered themselves um, the people of god and so in that sense uh, children of god uh, because they are descendants of abraham uh, so there is a kind of personal uh, relationship involved. So to an extent, they do think of God as father. But Jesus takes it to the next level when he begins to use that Aramaic word, Abba. Now, that is not a formal word. Uh, it would be a very personal word, uh, the kind that a kid would probably use uh, when addressing his daddy. Uh, so um, they would never go to that extent of you know regarding Yahweh as daddy, because that would they would feel that that makes it too informal and maybe uh, dis, uh, not honorable enough. Uh, so yes, they did not have Jesus level of um, uh, you know concept of 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 personal father, uh, someone that you can actually go to and say Abba to. So, but to an extent, they always saw themselves as um, Yahweh's people, and so his children in that sense. Um, yeah. I hope that helps. Yeah. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Um, OK, let's look at verses 5, 6, and 7. If someone could read out, please. But now I'm going to him who sent me, and none of you asks me. Where are you going? But because I've said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Yes. So uh, in verse 7, Jesus says, Very truly, I tell you, it is for your good 
that I am going away. Uh, and uh, you know, uh, you, you know, you must have read this in many places. Wherever it says, uh, "Truly, truly, I say to you," or "Very truly, I say to you," uh, it's like you know, Jesus is adding emphasis. Uh, if he had a bold font, you know, back in those days, and you had a you know, written print, uh, he would have actually put it in bold font, or he might have put it in red coloring. Uh, so the idea is to emphasize what he's about to say. So he's he's saying, "Very truly, I tell you." which automatically means everything that i'm going to say next is going to be like in bold capital font and it i know i want you to want it to catch your attention is this it is for your good that i am going away um so it is for our benefit that uh, jesus works god works all things you know we read that in uh, romans chapter 8 where it says that in all things god works for our good uh, so we see that same thing over here um just to dwell on that thought for a little bit, um, if we could actually, you know, go to Romans eight uh, verses twenty eight and twenty nine, um, and if someone could just read out Romans eight twenty eight and twenty nine. Romans eight twenty eight and twenty nine says, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to His purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be confirmed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Okay, so uh, we can have the assurance that even when something painful is happening uh, and we don't really understand why God has allowed that set of circumstances, one thing we can be sure of, uh, in those unpleasant circumstances also, uh, God is working uh, for our good because it says we know, you know, it's like a very confident knowing. Uh, Paul is making a statement and he's saying, um, he's not saying I guess, rather he's saying we know that in all things, okay, in all things, God works for the good of those who uh, love him because there's a purpose, there's a plan. He has already predestined them to be confirmed to the image of his son and his. Uh, he has a um, uh, purpose for their lives so it's all in place so to lead them to that goal so that they will fulfill those purposes for which they have been created he's going to start putting everything into place even this uh you know negative things which take place even in in or even in all of those negative things he will work for the good of his people now this does not mean that he wanted them to face all of those unfortunate uh you know events he allows it because he knows that he can give them the strength to overcome it and he knows that even as they go through that they will become stronger and their faith will grow and they will be able to fight greater battles against satan and win so he allows it okay so but it does not mean that he likes it that he enjoys uh, giving pain uh, to his people it is not saying that over here it is saying that when those terrible things happen and he allows them to happen because he knows that he will give us the strength to go through with it in those terrible circumstances, which he does not like. In those circumstances, he will continue working for our good. Now, there are some situations where we make a mistake. Either we have sinned or we have just taken a wrong decision because we did not bother to pray and seek God's guidance, and we end up in bad circumstances. What about those? Does God work for our good in those circumstances where I made the mistake, you know, where I took a wrong decision, or in fact, I was living in sin because of which I'm suffering these consequences? Uh, even in those cases, um, God works for our good simply because he has predestined us to be confirmed to the image of his son. And therefore, if we go to him in repentance, he will redeem us. He will restore us from those situations and circumstances in his own time, in his own way. Uh, so even when we make a mistake, we can still have the hope that if we go to him in true repentance, uh, he will redeem and restore uh, so that the plan that he has for our lives will not completely be cut off, but you know it can uh, continue. Uh, so we can always have hope that no matter how painful or unpleasant the circumstances are that we find ourselves in, the Lord is at work for our good. And so that is why here Jesus says, very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. And uh, 
then he goes on to explain why it would be good for them. Uh, we'll get to that later. Um, but over here, we have you know, Rupa who was posted Isaiah 6316. I shall remember this for future reference. Thank you so much. Um, so it's, it's, it's excellent. It says, but you are a father. Uh, though Abraham does not know, you know, all, all the rest of it. So uh, again, you have the phrase in the lower part of the verse, Lord, our father, our redeemer from of old is your name. So yes, they did have a sense of God being their father, but of course not in that very personal sense where you can go and say Papa or Daddy or something like a little child. Uh, that they probably would have thought is too personal and um, not something that human beings can actually have, uh, you know, that kind of a privilege. So they were not aware of that. But yes, they did have some understanding of the father. Mm. Yes, coming back to what we were uh, talking about here. Yes, why is it good for him to go away? Uh, Jesus says, the reason that I need to go away is unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Uh, so um, when the Holy Spirit comes, he would be in the believer. So which means the believer has access to the Lord 24 seven. You know, when Jesus was in his physical body, Jesus was um, had allowed himself to be restricted by human, you know, uh, uh, parameters. So he would also need to sleep. He would also need to take rest. He would go away to another place and then the disciples would no longer be with him. Uh, you know, because they would be in a, in a different spot. So uh, there's no continual 24-7 contact with Jesus while he was in his physical body. So it's in fact better that he goes away because when he uh, when he sends his spirit to them, when the advocate comes, uh, then, uh, uh, then believers will have 24-7 access to the Lord. Uh, so in fact, it is a good thing. It is a better thing. Also, we see uh, that it was necessary for Jesus to first do his um, work of atonement on the cross because a sinful person cannot have a relationship with the Spirit of God. So first of all, their sins had to be cleansed. Um, someone had to die on the cross and pay for them. And once they are cleansed, only then the Holy Spirit can come and take his residence in their lives and uh, you know they can have this personal relationship with him so that is why he explains and he says uh, if i don't go away i cannot send the uh, helper so it's only after the work on the cross is finished once the atonement is completed only then will the holy spirit be able to come and reside inside the person who has now been made righteous in jesus christ Otherwise, there would be no fellowship with the Spirit. Nobody can be um, can have the Holy Spirit living in them unless they have been made righteous and made clean through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. So he says, I will go away. And then when I go away, then I will be able to send you the advocate. And uh, um, uh, another thing which I noticed in your textbook, in fact, uh, you know, is the point they make over there about how uh, Jesus was with them for three years. And at the end of all the instruction that they received, all the training that they received, uh, what were they like? You know, in your textbook, it says that after all that ministry which Jesus did, they were still confused, thick headed, afraid, selfish, self centered. These are some of the terms which I used, uh, you know, in your textbook. But then when Jesus goes away, and then the Holy Spirit comes and starts, you know, living in them. Then what are they like? They turn into wise, surrendered, bold and giving people who go around sharing the gospel in power and performing signs and wonders. So um, the limitation was that uh, Jesus um, could not do an internal work of transformation. That's something that the Holy Spirit does. So as long as he was a physical person, only from the outside, he could talk, he would uh, he could influence, he could set an example for them to follow. So all this is an external work of the Lord. Uh, but uh, you also need an internal work of the Spirit. So as Jesus was ministering on the outside, the Holy Spirit would work inside people's hearts and, and help them to believe what Jesus is saying and all of that. Uh, but once they become believers, then literally the Holy Spirit lives inside them. And there's an internal work of transformation that goes on 24-7, depending on how nicely you are walking in step with the Spirit. 
Galatians chapter 5 makes that clear. If you're not walking in step with the Spirit, you know, you're limiting Him. But if you're walking in step with the Spirit every day and you're sensitive to His guidance, to His correction and all of that, then you will see that there's an, there's an internal work of transformation that's going on 24-7 inside our hearts. So it is better for Jesus to go away so that the Holy Spirit can come and literally reside inside a person uh, because then they can be transformed to a much greater extent. Uh, so we see that. Uh, this was beneficial for the believers, uh, for the for the disciples, that Je that Jesus should go away uh, physically. Uh, yeah. Uh, if uh, maybe we could have one person read out verses eight to eleven. Yes, please. Sixteen. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. Yes. So uh, here, um, the word that is used, um, he will prove the world to be in the wrong. Uh, uh, or you know, the, the word convict, he will convict the world. So the word over there, the Greek word that is used over there is to, it's not just to convince someone, but to convince them with solid proof, with compelling proof. So um, God will give compelling proof of why they are wrong and deserve judgment. Okay, so he will be able to convict people and show them that they are that they very much need a savior, that they are really in the wrong and judgment will come upon them if they do not submit. So he will provide compelling proof and convict them in that powerful sense. So what are the three things that he convicts them of? First, um, they will be made to realize that if they reject Jesus um, about sin because people do not believe in me. So anyone who rejects what Jesus is saying, and refuses to believe it, they will remain in their sin. Uh, the second thing, convict them about righteousness because I'm going to the Father. So they will be convicted and uh, they will have be given this assurance that once Jesus goes to the Father, uh, he will intercede for them and they will be made righteous. So there is a solution. They don't have to be, they don't have to be stuck in their sin. If they believe in him, he will go to the Father, and because he goes to the Father, they will be made righteous. And the third thing that he will convict them of is that if they refuse to do this, then all that remains for them is judgment. The prince of this world has been judged, and in the same way, they too will be judged along with the prince of the world if they choose not to believe in Jesus and take sides with him. Uh, so these are things that the Holy Spirit will convict a person of if they are willing and open to hear from him. On the other hand, when they start hearing from him, if they immediately harden their hearts because they don't want to get rid of the status quo, they enjoying the comfort of it too much, then the Holy Spirit will just bide his time. You know, he may give an, uh, another few opportunities where again and again he will give them chance to repent. If they still don't, then you know the, the, the judgment is all that awaits them. So this is the work of conviction which the Holy Spirit will do where he will provide evidence and proof to them in their heart uh, to help them believe what is being presented. Uh, verses 12 to 15, if we could have someone read out. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whoever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine, therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Yes. So uh, in verse 12, Jesus says, I have much more to say to you more than you can now bear. So um, right now, Jesus is not inside their heart. 
so the Holy Spirit is not taking permanent residence inside them. So there are certain things which they still will not be able to really understand, uh, not be able to really fully grasp. So Jesus says there are many more things to be said, but they, they cannot be said now. Uh, when the Holy Spirit comes to live in you, then he will make all of these things uh, very, very clear. So in a way, Jesus is paving the way for the other uh, books of the New Testament, which will come along, you know, after the Gospels are written. Uh, so because there are people who say the sayings of Jesus, you know, wherever Jesus says, Jesus said so and so, I will believe those things. But what the humans have written, what Paul wrote and Peter wrote, how can I believe that? Because those are things which the which humans have written is the argument they present. But here Jesus says, you know, I have not finished telling everything that, that needs to be said so that you can grow in faith. There are many, many more things to be said and they will be revealed through the Holy Spirit. So which is why later uh, the Holy Spirit inspired uh, people like Paul and Peter uh, and James so that they were able to uh, give a more elaborate explanation of things that Jesus had just very briefly touched upon. Uh, so. Uh, we must honor and believe whatever Jesus directly spoke, but we also give the same importance to whatever was written by Paul and Peter and James and the others, uh, simply because uh, they were acting under the influence of Jesus' spirit, who, whom Jesus had sent personally to explain uh, to them in greater detail. So we must accept all of the New Testament as uh, the word of God. and. Um, uh, we see, um, uh, again, it's, it's in your textbook where it talks about, it, it kind of draws a comparison uh, between Jesus and the Holy Spirit and, in fact, the disciples. Um, in John 15, 15, yeah, maybe someone could read out John 15, 15, and then, you know, the comparison becomes a little clearer. John 15, 15. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. All that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. So Jesus, when he is on the earth, um, as a human being, he allows himself to be taught by the father. So all the things which he receives from the father, which he learns from the father, that he passes on to the disciples. He uh, reveals it to them. He presents it to them. So Jesus receives and Jesus uh, passes it on to his people. In the same way, now over here in this passage, we see the Holy Spirit um, receiving something from Jesus and passing it on to the people. Because that's what we see, right? In verse 13, where it says, he will speak only what he hears. So whatever he hears from Jesus, that he will pass on to the disciples. Uh, again, it says in verse 14, he will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive. And uh, um, yeah, and then it says in verse 15, spirit will receive from me and he will make known to you. So what he has received from Jesus, he will now reveal to the disciples. So we see uh, Jesus receiving from the father and revealing it to the disciples. The Holy Spirit receives from Jesus and reveals it to the disciples. And the disciples who have now received from the Father and from the Holy Spirit and from Jesus, now they are supposed to witness and pass it on to other people. Uh, so it's never just the receiving. The receiving is always to be followed by a uh, passing it on to others, revealing it to others so that they too can know, can know these truths. A, a, it is never meant to be knowledge that just stored away in the mind and you do nothing about it. No, it is always uh, any spiritual knowledge from the Bible. You know, it is always meant not just to be received, but then uh, to be applied and passed on to others so that they also can benefit uh, from what has been taught. So that's one learning that we get from this particular passage. Um, and then, um, um, moving on to six, if we could have someone read out verses 16 to 18, please. A little while and you will see me no longer and again a little while and you will see me. So some of his disciples said to one another, what is this that he says to us? 
a little while and you will not see me and uh, again a little while and you will see me and because I'm going to the father. So they were saying, what does he mean by a little while? We do not know what he is talking about. So, uh, I mean, we have much clarity about what Jesus was saying because this is explained more fully to us, you know, in the epistles. Uh, but at that point of time, the epistles had not yet been written. So uh, the disciples are not still very, very clear about what Jesus is saying. So their main concern is, okay, Lord, you're saying that you're going to go away and we cannot come, you know, to where you are um, and we can't follow you over there. You're saying that later on you will come and you'll take us with you to your home. So that's fine. But now this thing that you're talking about, you know, going away for a little while, how long is that time period? Because um, they have given up everything in life to be with him. And he's talking about going away. And he's saying that they cannot go to where he is right now. So they are asking, what do you mean by this little while? Exactly how short is this little while? Uh, you know, you can see their uh, concern. So it, it, it's a discussion that's going on among them. Uh, because it says in verse 18, they kept asking. So this is something. Uh, and in verse 17, it says they said to one another. So there's a lot of um, uh, worrying going on uh, because their master whom they have fully trusted and whom they have followed is now talking about going away. And he's talking about some paracletos, you know, who's going to come and be with them. But that is... Uh, still sounds like a foreign entity. They, it's not something that they have fully understood, and they are so anxious that their master is going. So this, the, so this must have been a real uh, topic of conversation. Uh, and they know they kept talking among themselves and, and wondering how long will it be? Will it be for a very long time? Did he mean years or did he mean months? And uh, they're rather concerned about this. Uh, but that wording in a little while, which Jesus uses. The Greek word used over there is something called mikron. It means a short duration of time, uh, but it also means something very insignificant. So it's like Jesus is saying, you know, you are going to feel uh, that kind of a, a sense of loss when I go away, but it's going to be so insignificant because what's going to come next will be so amazing that you will not even think about the short, uh, you know, gap, time gap when I was not there. Uh, and which is so true, right? Because later when the Holy Spirit comes into them, uh, they are filled with joy, they're filled with boldness, and uh, they experience Jesus in a much greater way uh, once the Holy Spirit has come. So here Jesus is saying, you know, in a, in a very ins for, a, for a very, very insignificant amount of time, I'll be going away, but don't worry, it will not even make a difference because very, very soon after that, you will have the advocate with you. You will have the helper with you. And uh, uh, then it will not even matter to you that we had this brief time of parting. Okay, it's what Jesus says. Um, moving on to verses uh, 19 to 22. Uh, if someone could read out, please. Jesus knew what they wanted to ask him. So he said to them, is this what you're asking yourself? Why am I meant by saying a little while and you will not see me again? A little while and you will see me. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, it, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. 21. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. In. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish, for joy that a human being has been born into the world. 22. So also you have sorrow. How, so, so also you have sorrow now. But I will see you again now, and your heart will rejoice. No one take your joy from you. Okay, so over here, the uh, the imagery of a woman giving birth to a child is used in a positive sense. I've just noticed that generally in the Old Testament, wherever this imagery is used, it tends to be used in a very negative way because the emphasis over there is on the pain, uh, the, the sheer struggle. Uh, and so it's kind of used in a sense of judgment, you know, uh, where God says, you know, you will be in pains of uh, like, like, a, like a woman in labor uh, because, you know, God's judge, judgment is coming upon you and you'll be filled with uh, horror and all of that. So the emphasis seems to be more on the pain and the struggle in the Old Testament. 
But here in the New Testament, where this imagery is used, it's used in a very positive sense. It's talking about um, a new life being born. So yes, there is a struggle. But that struggle is followed by something uh, very beautiful, a life which is so amazing that you even forget the struggle. Um, so more than the Old Testament scriptures, maybe we should look at a New Testament scripture, you know, which will help us to understand what is being said. So that would be Romans chapter 8, uh, verses 22 to 23. Uh, well, OK, we are kind of out of time, right? So maybe we can read Romans 8, 22 to 23. Uh, when we come back from our um, from our break, uh, so uh, let's get back together at ten o'clock. Thank you.